Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. So as we were talking about at the beginning of the show... Al Jazeera's got this new documentary out, The Day Israel Attacked America, about the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty and the Mediterranean Sea in 1967. And so on the line, I have Ray McGovern. Uh, Ray, uh, you write at consortiumnews.com. You're a former CIA analyst. And now, uh, I know we've talked about this, but I forget, uh, you were in the CIA at the time that this happened, correct? I was, yeah. I was chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch at the time. Chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch at the time. Wow. Okay, so um, I guess you had the clearance. So can we start with, um, well, I don't know. Tell it however you want, I guess, but it would be nice if you could tell us uh, from your own personal experience at the time uh, what all you knew, what you were being told, what everybody else knew, and based on what, and then we can get into all the later developments. Sure. Well, I wasn't, uh, you know, in direct receipt the information from the scene of time, but many of my friends were. Uh, I talked with the chief, my counterpart, the chief of the Arab Israeli desk at the time, oh, a couple of years ago, and I said, "What do you recall about knowing uh, how this was done? Whether it was a mistake or deliberate, and and so forth?" He said, "Ray, uh, the." Except the message is made clear. We knew that the Israelis did it, that they did it deliberately. We're not quite sure why would they do this kind of thing, but that it was deliberate, there was no doubt. And all our bosses knew that, too. Secretary of State Rusk, uh, Richard Helms, the head of the CIA, Bobby Ray Inman, the head of the NSA, which is on this film, who was on this film, they all knew it. Now, what's the teaching point here for me? <laughs> There was a one of them, not one of them, that had the guts to go down to the Times Bureau in Washington or the Washington Post. I mean, both of these newspapers, now people need to realize that these were independent newspapers in 1967, all right? If you gave them documents or if you gave them first testimony, they would check it out, yes, but they wouldn't check it with the White House. <laughs> as they do now, they check it out with other sources, and it would appear within a day or two on their front page. So that's all that was necessary. So when Bobby Ray Inman, the head of NSA, pontificates in this film about, yes, well, a decision was made, a decision was made to uh, absolve the Israelis and accept their apology. Well, hello. Where were you, Bobby Ray Inman? You took a solemn oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But So let me ask a follow-up right there, because in the movie, and I'm sorry, I did not get to watch the entire thing. I'm about uh, mm-hmm. two-thirds of the way through it. But they talk about how Johnson himself leaked to Newsweek that uh, and and said, you know, just call me an unnamed official kind of a thing, and 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 said that, yeah, they did it deliberately, Apparently because they thought we were intercepting their transmissions and they wanted yeah. to stop that. Well, you know, there's no accounting for uh, for presidents running off at the mouth. And Johnson was notorious for that. Uh, what seems not quite fully accurate to me in the film, Scott, we know that from the very start, from the very start, when the SOS was put out there, the Israelis intercepted it the SOS from the USS Liberty, and got out of Dodge, right? Uh, Those torpedo boats uh, scrammed out of there, back to their home port and the planes as well. Now, planes were launched from the USS Saratoga and the USS America in the mid and were sent down to do battle with whoever it was that was attacking a U.S. Navy ship called the Liberty, okay? Now, we know 
We know that Admiral Geis, who was the uh, head of the 6th Fleet there, was called by McNamara, the Secretary of, De- of Defense, and he was told, call those, call those planes back. Uh, we don't want them going near that ship. Call them back to, to land on those uh, air carriers. And Geist, to his great credit, said, I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, but my, my, my naval ship is under attack and I'll need to speak to your supervisor before I carry out that order. <laughs> and who is on an adjoining line? But Secretary of Defense's Robert McNamara's supervisor, his name was Lyndon Johnson, and he got on the phone and he said, Now, Admiral, I want you to call those planes back right away. We don't want to embarrass our ally Israel. And Geis very reluctantly broke the attack, summoned the planes back to their aircraft carriers. Now, you know the rest of the story. Uh, when when the, the ship limped back to port, well, to port in Malta, um, all these people were were guarded, were told they couldn't speak to anyone. These naval people, the survivors, after they dug out the body remains from that uh, tomb there where the NSA machines and people were, uh, they were told, you're not allowed to talk to anyone about this, including one another. Your wife, any men of your family, under pain of court-martial. Now, I know some of these guys, okay, and I've talked to them about this, and you want to know a prescription for PTSD, Scott? Well, that's it. That's it. These guys have been suffering, suffering since 1967. Only recently have they felt it possible to talk with one another and have gotten together at least annually to see what could be done in terms of righting this terrible wrong. So that's, you know, that was a little bit misleading. It wasn't later that Johnson said, oh, well, I have this choice to make. Uh, I need to protect the Israelis because they need money for my reelection. Ironically, of course, he didn't run in, in 1968. It wasn't that. It was from the very first part, the very first incident when Johnson himself intervened. I'd never heard of this before. Intervened with the, with the admiral running the sixth fleet in the med and said, Call those planes back. We don't want to embarrass our ally Israel. That's how bad it was. That is and amazing. other things that haven't come out in the film, it was uh, it was acknowledged that the Medal of Honor is always, always given by the president in the Oval Office. But not for Captain McGonagall. Not for this heroic captain who had lost lots of blood from a severe gash in his leg but steered Liberty back to Malta. Not to him. No, he was, uh, we see the Defense Department little guidance. No press conference here. And it's better if the Department of Defense uh, gives this Medal of Honor. And you know what else? The State Department, before deciding they could go through with giving the Medal of Honor to Captain McGonagall, thought it necessary to call the Israeli embassy and ask if they would take offense if that happened. Can you imagine, Scott? Well, and as yeah. they say in this article, too, and you know, I wasn't alive back then, but Lyndon Johnson just sounds like Barack Obama to me when they said, well, they threatened that they would accuse him of blood libel. Well, anyone ought to just laugh at that. You know, that, well, you know, that no what... one is allowed to accuse anyone who happens to be Jewish of doing anything ever or else it's blood libel. Give me a break. When it's not even in question, the facts here. I'm sorry we got to take this break. We'll be right back in just one second about the coward Lyndon Johnson and the sure, USS no Liberty. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Edited by libertarian purist Sheldon Richmond, the Future of Freedom brings you the best of our movement, featuring articles by Richmond, Jacob Hornberger, James Bovard, and many more. The Future of Freedom stands for peace and liberty and against our criminal world empire and Leviathan state. Subscribe today. It's just $25 per year for the back pocket size print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's the Future of Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. Peace and freedom. Thank you. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. I'm online with Ray McGovern. Uh, I think his audio quit cutting out on us. So we're going to keep going with Skype because the audio quality is better as long as it's not cutting out all the time. 
Uh, we're talking about the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty and this new documentary made by uh, Al Jazeera, aljazeera.net, The Day Israel Attacked America. You can find it in my Twitter feed there if you're looking, um, or on my new Sue page. Um, and now, I'm sorry, uh, let's see where we left off here. Oh, I know what I wanted to talk with you about here. Oh, well, where we left off was the blood libel thing, the political threat to the President of the United States, that you can't say that this was on purpose or we'll accuse you of the blood libel and that'll be the worst thing that ever happened to your political career. Am I wrong to think that that's absolutely ridiculous? The blood libel, for people who aren't aware, is the myth that Jews put little Christian children in their witch's brew or whatever crap left over from the, uh, you know, medieval times, uh, a thousand years ago or something like that, twelve hundred years ago. Um, that, that any accusation that the Israeli military attacked a ship for a reason would amount to blood libel? I don't think the American people would have taken that seriously at all, would they? Come on. No, it's, at, uh, it's a diversionary tactic here. Uh, blood libel is so ridiculous that people will, re- will reject it uh, instinctively. What it really involves is money. As long as you can say uh, that this or that thing is anti-Semitic, you seriously endanger your chances of remaining president, of being reelected, or even aspiring to be president. Now, let me give you a very re- recent example, okay? When the, the sainted David Petraeus was coming back and he was going to be the head of the CIA and even before that when he was testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, his people uh, prepared a statement which said the truth here. It talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict fomenting anti American sentiment and by implication being being responsible for the death of US soldiers now when that got out we have released emails from David Petraeus who inadvertently released these to a friend of mine and what he does immediately as soon as the press uh, plays this up uh, Petraeus might be anti-semitic he calls Ma- Max boot who's a uh, you know charter neocon and he says Max what are we going to do the date of this is 16 March 2010, so it predates uh, his discrediting later at the hands of the White House later that year. So he says, Max, what do we do? And Max, uh, Max Boots says, no, look, uh, I'll do another, I'll do a little op-ed, and we'll, we'll prove to the world that you're not an anti-Semitic. Uh, and, and Petraea says, oh, thanks, Max. Now, Max, would it help if folks knew that I hosted Ellie Weasel and his wife at our quarters last Sunday night, and and that I'll be the speaker for the the 65th anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camps in mid-April at the Capitol Dome. Max Boot. No, I don't think that's relevant because they're really not accusing you of being anti-Semitic. <laughs> Petraeus in his email says, "Roger!" Exclamation point. Smile face. Now. There's a snively, there's an obsequious, there is an unprincipled person who will not acknowledge his own written testimony before the Senate because people have started to brand that as anti-Semitic. As I say, he wanted to be president, maybe not that time around, but this time around. It ain't going to happen. Why? Well, as I said before, he got too big for his britches. And I just don't, I don't just mean, um, Paul Well, Paul, Paul of Broadwell or whatever his name was. I mean the White House. Uh, he became a threat to the White House. And so Obama and his cronies said, look, uh, uh, General Alexander from the NSA, you get together with Bobby. All right, all right. Ray, we yep, talked about all this on the show yesterday. Right, okay. So let's but get I back mean, to the liberty here. We got limited time. All right. So, so yes, you're right. Battle. David Petraeus had to crawl on his belly just like Lyndon Johnson before the almighty Israel lobby instead of just speaking the plain truth, which is here's apparently that, anti-Semitic. Here's something that you might, uh, those who've seen the film uh, know that uh, Sergeant uh, Bryce Lockwood, uh, who was one of the folks that had to dip down inside the tomb there where uh, I think it was 20 of his NSA folks that were were working for him, their bodies and the machinery were, um, he had a chance to uh, come forward and tell his story. 
but not until 2006, after Mearsheimer and Waltz had written that very courageous article for the Atlantic magazine called The Israel Lobby. Now, you say, Atlantic magazine? Did it be? No, no, it was by the Atlantic magazine. <laughs> but when they saw the text, they held their nose and said, oh, we can't publish this. We'll pay anyway, but oh, gosh, we can't. So they had to go to the London Review of Books, just like it had to be Al Jazeera earlier this week that, that did the documentary. London Review of Books. Now, I read that article on my way down to Missouri where Bryce Lockwood lives. And I gave a, a, a talk at a church hall 300 people. And people asked me, what did you think of Mearsheimer and Waltz's uh, uh, article? And I said, yeah, I just read it. I think it's great, but there's one anomaly about it that I don't understand. And I said, what is that? I said, you know, they're out to prove how powerful the Israel lobby is, but they don't mention the most vivid example of that. Everybody says, well, what's that? I said, the USS Liberty. Now, well, there are 300 people in that church hall. Yeah, they all said, and they that? all looked at me with blank stairs and I said how many people know about the USS Liberty three people raised their hands I asked the guy in the front what does he do stands up ramrod straight and says Sergeant Bryce Lockwood USS Liberty crew sir I say uh, uh, Sergeant Lockwood would you would you be prepared to to tell what happened that day sir um, I uh, I have not been able to do that just yet but it's been it's been 40 years now, and I think I'd like to try tonight. And he got up and for the next 10 minutes gave a riv- riveting, incredibly poignant account of what he experienced. He was lucky because he was taking the very sensitive equipment to drop overboard. He was beyond the bulwark when torpedo hit. But he dived back in, and he saved two of those folks, one of whom is shown in the film. So what I'm saying here is that not even, not even Stephen Waltz and John Mearsheimer thought that they should adduce the example of the liberty in this book, or now it's a book, but in this article that was out to prove that the Israelis know, literally, they get away with her. I wonder why US that is. Have you ever had a chance to ask Mearsheimer that, or Walt? Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> I did talk to Mearsheimer about it and and he said well you know um, you have to uh, it, it wasn't a very satisfactory answer uh, it was like uh, you know the, we had space constraints and we didn't want to overdo it or something like that so but you know they, they, I'm not criticizing them I mean they, they did an incredible service by doing that and that was a gutsy thing to do saying is even they right. had these compunctions yeah all right now so let me ask you about this stuff because What's supposedly brand new in this documentary, Ray, uh, are these intercepts of the Israelis that we hear. Now, I don't speak Hebrew. I don't suppose you do. Or, hell, I don't know that. Um, but uh, I was wondering if you can speak to the prominence of these uh, of this audio. Do you know, has there been a debate about their origin and whether those translations are accurate and everything else? Because the story that the clips tell is that they knew it was an American ship all along, uh, they finally call it off on the word that, yeah, it's American, all right, after napalming it, being directed to napalm it, despite that fact. And then even after the planes pull away, they send in the patrol boats, according to the translations uh, put up on the screen in this documentary here. Uh, and even then they send in the patrol, uh, the, the boats to, uh, the torpedo boats to try to sink the thing that way. And um, I was just wondering if, if you can speak to that, if you know people in NSA or if you know where they got these clips from or any of that stuff that can uh, speak to this. Sure, I can. Um, the tapes themselves were, quote, destroyed, end quote. But there are all kinds of firsthand witnesses. I mentioned the branch chief who was my colleague at CIA. No doubt. Uh, you know, one of the pilots says, but that's an American flag. Like an American ship. Perform your mission. Perform your mission. So it was very, very clear. Now, Pat Lang, Colonel Pat Lang, who's a friend of mine and who has been in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, uh, he was at uh, Fort Holliburg, which used to be the intelligence school that he and I attended, and he was taking a course in which they adduced all the examples of the intercepted uh, communications as a case history of how good NSA could uh, could do to perform its mission. 
So there's no doubt at all. The only new thing here is to hear actually the Hebrew. Now, I don't know Hebrew, but I hadn't heard, uh, you know, the actual authentic voices. And I have a little reason to believe that they are inauthentic. Oh, yeah. I mean, I certainly had not heard that they were challenged or anything like that. I just wondered if you knew specifically where they got these. Did they get them from the Americans or did they get them from an Israeli source? Or uh, has there, do you know if anybody has argued about their origin and really shown yet or... You know, anything like well, that? Because I yeah. would expect it to come up if there was any doubt. And, you know, it seemed pretty legit yeah, I, to me. Uh, as I say, it's not new except for the actual Hebrew. And, uh, you know, I, my hat off to Al Jazeera. I don't know how they got them, whether they got them from Tel Aviv, whether they got them from NSA. But they got them. And isn't it a telling thing that this has to appear on Al Jazeera and not on 60 Minutes? Um, I sent a tweet to... Richard Silverstein from the Tikkun Olong blog, and I know he reads Hebrew, and I believe that he must probably speak it too, I don't know. Uh, but I asked him if he could verify the translations, obviously not the origin of, of, uh, where it came from, but whether the, the, uh, captioning on the screen matches the Hebrew being spoken, and I was, you know, I'm hoping that he can, uh, respond to me on that I, I was hoping he'd get back to me before the end of this interview unfortunately not but i'm trying to find out anyway yeah that's a good idea but as i say there are lots of tapes there are lots of conversations here it wasn't just one pilot to control center right, it was right. a whole bunch of folks so there's mm -hmm. no doubt it would be nice to follow up though yeah, sure. Just really because I have the audio now. And so for later, yeah. it'd be nice if, you know, I have independent verification of these clips so that I can play them, you know, sure. later on. But anyway, you know, there were uh, two real heroes in this story that are not brought out. I don't know why in the film. I don't know if we have time to talk about those or not. But you know what? We're really already important. over time, but I'm happy to continue okay. going on because this is such an important story. And most of the listeners are by way of the podcast feed later anyway, Ray. So, okay. so I'd be happy to, to hear the stories. Yeah. Well, I mentioned Bryce Lockwood, L-O-C-K-W-O-O-D, lives in Missouri. Um, he's just kind of, well, it was a very traumatic experience for all of them. But Bryce has been one of the most active in, uh, in pushing the story and trying to get uh, the American Legion and others to recognize the dilemma that they all found themselves in. Now, he was the fellow that was in the third row that I called on. You, did anybody know about the Liberty? And I said, yes, uh, Sergeant Bryce Lockwood, USS Liberty crew, sir, came up and talked about it. Well, Later, he gave an interview to Tell Somebody, a uh, community radio station with Tom Clammer in Kansas City, and it was incredible, a couple hours. And it was the first time that Bryce felt that he could tell the story, and it was a cathartic experience for him. It was an emotional experience for all of us because he talked about seeing into that torpedo hole and two bodies were still alive. He dove in and got one of them, grabbed them as you do when, you know, life-saving Red Cross sort of thing, and then the hatch was closed. He's banging on the hatch. Finally, somebody opens it, and he hoists this one of his comrades up into safety, and he, I believe, is one of the people interviewed in the film. Then he went back for the second one. He grabbed them the same way, and just as he's as getting to the hatch, he slipped out, out through the hole, into the Mediterranean in a, in a salty, watery death. Um, that's got to be an experience that any, any of us will, will never forget. But that was the one that Sergeant Lockwood experienced with the people under his command. Most of them, well, not most of the Marines, but he was the senior Marine officer. Now, the other fellow, and this is a wonderful story, and I learned about it later, um, it was a, a young Texan named Terry Halbardier. I think he was 19 at the time. In any case, he was one of the sailors on this ship. And when the napalm was dropped on the deck, and when the whole place was shut up, and when the antennae were all taken out, the live antennae that the Israelis knew who had the capability of transmitting an SOS, Terry Halbardier went to Captain McGonagall and he said, Sir, 
you know that antenna, antenna that has not been working for this whole voyage? I think I can get it connected. I think we might be able to get an SOS. McGonagall. Where is it? It's over there across the deck. McGonagall. Don't you know that's full of napalm, man? You can't do that. Terry Harbuggy. Har- I like to try. So he goes out there and he plugs the two connectors and they get the SOS out. And that's the only reason, the only reason why the Israelis were unsuccessful in sinking that ship and killing the entire crew. Now, um, Halbajie was given the Navy Cross, Silver Cross, I guess it is, uh, in, 19, in 2009 out there in California, where he lives now, in Visalia, California. When I heard that was happening, I hopped on the next plane, went out, and was privileged to take part in that ceremony. Uh, it was May 27th, 09. I wrote it up for consortiumnews.com. But it was there that in this small uh, office of the U.S. represent the, <laughs> the House representative from that district uh, had him there, and his name was Nunez. He gave him the Civil Cross, and many of his comrades were there, and I was privileged to have lunch with them and to hear hear their stories, many of them saying it for the first time, because, as I said, they were prohibited from even sharing uh, sharing information with one another. And so Terry Harbardier died uh, just about three months ago, and I wrote another article marking that death and, and recalling all the kinds of things that he did. And, you know, somebody, one of the press said, well, do you have any, did you get hurt? <laughs> he pulled up his shirt. His stomach's full of holes, shrapnel all over his body. And I don't know, we did that when he, when he connected the thing or it was done at, at another time. But so these are. Well, actually, they said in hero. this doc, they said in this doc that he got that shrapnel on his way across the deck to plug the antenna yeah. in, as you said. Yeah. So there you go. You know, there, there are real heroes in this whole thing. And when you know about that heroism, how much more, gosh, how much, how much more angry does an Irishman like me get to think that they were deprived not only of the honor to which they were entitled, but they were deprived of the right to tell their story, for God's sake. They were, they were deprived of the right to be physically and mentally whole as a result of this terrible experience. And so now, with this film out, thanks to Al Jazeera, uh, I hope that Americans can, can kind of realize, you know, what a, oh, what an albatross this is around all our necks. And, uh, things do seem to be moving in the direction of recognizing Netanyahu for being the, uh, the person that he, he really is. And uh, I just hope that, uh, our president, will develop the kind of backbone that will enable him to say, look, Netanyahu, enough, rather than tell one of his little staff to call Netanyahu dirty names, you know. (laughs) The cowardice here is incredible. And what Obama needs to do is grow up and grow a couple. Yeah, well, too late for that, man. He's a lame duck now. Uh, So if he was ever weak, now he's weaker. When it, well, when it comes to trying to do the right thing whatsoever, of course, he can do the wrong thing all he wants, no problem. But anyway, um, I appreciate your time on the show and, and your dedication to this subject, Ray, because as you say, most people have never even heard of this thing whatsoever. And, yeah. uh, they might begin to have a lot different view. I think not just of the, um, the, uh, America's relationship with the state of Israel, but also the American people's relationship with their government and the media that, boy, when they're determined on erasing something from history, they get away with it pretty good. I mean, it's not like they can yet, you know, lock you away under the NDAA for even mentioning it, but they can pretty much erase it from any kind of, you know, I don't think there's a college history textbook that would contain it anywhere, right, for example. Stuff like that, it's it's just gone. No, I bet you if you ask Dan Rather, he's never freaking heard of it, probably. I don't know. Yeah, and, you know, another sort of teaching point here, as I see it, is the snivelly kind of obsequious attitude on the part of four stars, three stars, two stars, whether admirals or whether they're generals. Yeah. You know, they swore an oath to the Constitution, not to the president, not to their own careers. 
And when you look at Bobby Ray Hinman, for example, now they had him on because he's the most respected senior intelligence ever in this country, okay? He ran the NSA. He had the presence of mind to quit when he was deputy to Bill Casey at CIA. He was regarded as, you know, he, he was... He actually drafted most of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the so-called FISA, back in 1978, which put restrictions on NSA's ability to collect on Americans. Now, why do I mention him? (laughs) I mention him because when it turned out that General Hayden, head of NSA, had trashed the Fourth Amendment just because Cheney told him to, and started collecting information on all of us without a warrant and without probable cause, Bobby Ray Inman was invited to a session at the New York Public Library with James Risen, who wrote the story, and a couple other folks. Now I know somebody was there. Who was there? And 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 what happened? They asked Inman whether he thought of it. He says, well, uh, Hayden clearly broke the law. I know what the law was. I... I drafted part of the law, and I even insisted in putting a paragraph in that said, nothing that is not specifically designated here as allowable can be allowed in terms of eavesdropping on Americans. So, sure, he broke the law. Now, <laughs> that was written up uh, in a, an obscure blog, but I read it, and I'm thinking about, wow, you know, that's interesting. Here, Bobby Ray Inman is saying that what Hayden did was was uh, unlawful. Now, what happens? That very same day, the president, Bush, nominates General Michael Hayden to be head of the CIA for services performed. <laughs> okay. Now, we're talking May of 2006. Now, bear with me because the story gets even better. Um on the 4th of May, I had this uh, debate with Rumsfeld in Atlanta and got a lot of media attention. So uh, Lou Dobbs uh, had me up to New York to interview me about, you know, my my uh, vendetta against, <laughs> against Secretary Rumsfeld. So I'm waiting in Lou Dobbs' office, you know. And that morning, I'm just feeling really good about what I know about what Bobby Ray Inman said about Hayden. And I'm saying, you know... I don't think he's going to be confirmed when people learn about that, you know? And what happens? In rushes Bobby Ray Inman, all disheveled. No tie on for the first time I've ever seen him. And somebody rushes, puts a tie on. And when I was supposed to go into that uh, interview, Bobby Ray Inman goes in instead. And I'm saying, oh, this is good. This is good. Because Hayden has just been nominated to be head of the CIA if Inman tells the real story about Hayden, he's finished. He can't be head of the CIA, and he shouldn't be. So I'm watching the big screen there, right, waiting for my turn. And, and Ludov says, well, uh, Admiral Inman, uh, tell me, uh, what do you think the nomination here of, uh, of General Hayden to be head of the CIA? And Inman says, you couldn't pick a better person. He's incredibly bright. He's technically proficient. Character, you know, character, no problem, he did, full of integrity, is a wonderful choice. And I'm looking at that, it's kind of, <laughs> no, no. So he comes out of the door, you know, and I said, hey, Bobby Ray, what happened to what you said just 10 days ago? And he tucks, you know, he, you know, he runs, I would have been after him, except he, I still had three minutes left of Lou Dobbs' time, right? So, you know, this, even the best of them, even the best. Why did I say that? Because Amy Goodman had the videotape of what Admiral Inman had said at the New York Public Library 10 days. And she played it that morning. The hearings for his nomination, for Hayden's nomination, were coming up just three days hence. And so Bobby Ray Inman got the word, Admiral Inman, you're really screwed up at the New York Public Library. It's bad enough uh, that you said those things. Amy Goodman played them this morning. We carved out a few minutes for you at Lou Dobbs. You go and make restitution and do it now. (laughs) And so so there's a story about the snivelly relationship between um, four stars, three stars. And I could go on because there are lots of examples. Petraeus is one. And General Zinni, 
the, the well-respected Marine general who sat there and listened to Dick Cheney tell lie after lie about WMD in Iraq on the 26th of August 2002, he should have spoken up because he knew they were lies. He waited three and a half years to do that. So these guys really should be held accountable just like everybody else. And that's the great Ray McGovern, everybody. 27 years as a CIA analyst. Now he's a peacenik. He goes around speaking against war for Tell the Word, and he writes uh, mostly at consortiumnews.com. You can also find him at raymondgovern.com. Hey, Al Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren's Coffee. Order now at darrenscoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and save $2. darrenscoffee.com. Hey, Al Scott here for MyHeroesThink.com. They sell beautiful 7-inch busts of libertarian heroes Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, and Harry Brown. These finely crafted statues from MyHeroesThink.com make excellent decorations for your desktop at work, bookends for your shelves, or gifts for that special individualist in your life. They're also all available in colors now, too. Of course, gold, silver, or bronze. Coming soon, Hayek, Hazlitt, Carlin. Use promo code Scott Horton and save $5 at MyHeroesThink.com. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, Al Scott Horton here. Are you a libertarian and or peacenik? Live in North America? If you want, you can hire me to come and give a speech to your group. I'm good on the terror war and intervention, civil liberty stuff, blaming Woodrow Wilson for everything bad in the world, Iran, central banking, political realignment, and, well, you know, everything. I can teach markets to liberals and peace to the right. Just watch me. Check out scotthorton.org slash speeches for some examples and email me scott at scotthorton.org for more information. See you there. 